What's up, garden friend? Jeff here, Tropical Plant Party. How's everybody doing? I hope you're good. I'm good. It'd be better if I know you're good too. This week, just like all the others when it comes to the twig, that's this week in gardening. Things are scattered all over the place. Not much gardening happening, but a lot of talking. A lot of talking, mostly about gardening things, and then, you know, the ADD kicks in and fun stuff happens. It'll be an adventure. Got some nice fruit coming in here on the Ponicioris. Ponicurus, the trifoliate orange. This is the dragon's one, the one that's crazy and bendy and big, nasty, gnarly spikes on it. And the fruit this year is much bigger, but there's not as much of it. We had some bad storms that knocked a lot of the flowers off in the springtime. Uh, the fruit really doesn't taste that great on this. You can make like a marmalade or a jam or something out of them. I generally don't. I just really think it's fun seeing the nice colorful balls on the plant throughout the winter time because it stays green. It loses its leaves, but the wood stays green and you have those fun citrus fruits hanging from it. It's nice. If you don't live someplace where you can grow citrus outdoors, give this a shot. It should be good through zone six. Maybe a nice protected zone five as well. well I picked up a new pot that I'm going to be using for my dog's watering bowl. The problem I've been having with this one is that basically it's, it's I think it's just a little bit too high. The dogs really don't seem to like drinking out of it and I need to have something out here with moving water. I prefer it's filtered. I do keep carbon pads inside that little waterfall. Just the cleanliness is good for their health because without the moving cool water they drink out of the pool. Any pool water is not good for your dogs. Now I picked this up from my local pond supply nursery where they actually go through and they use non-toxic epoxies to fill in the holes. This is easy to do at home. I've done it myself with other pots. Uh, but it was nice it was already done and it was like 70% off or something like that. So that doesn't hurt. And it's really, it has more surface area. A little bit, a little bit more shallow, more surface area. I think it's just going to look a little bit nicer. The thing I like about this pot though is that it's actually plastic, so when I put lights in it, it shines really, really pretty. But I don't know if that's a good enough reason to keep it over here. So, I'm gonna go ahead and swap them out and see how it looks. Alright, so I got some of the water drained out of here, and I'm just gonna slide this. And I'm gonna do all the things that make this happen. There we go, now I'm just gonna pull this back over, and uh... Start selling it. Oh, I just screamed, high pitched, like a little girl. Where'd it go? We have a frog friend in here. Look at that. That's really nice. I'm really happy about that. There has been a frog in my pool for several months. It got huge. His name was Gorf. Uh, he was tame, like you could pick him up and everything. And, uh, a dog got him a few days ago, and I was actually really bummed and sad about that. He was a cool frog. The dogs always get the frogs, but this one was smart. It was able to get away from him, usually. And uh, it's, it's been nice having him around. I don't know how he's surviving the salt water, but he was. And uh, this has been the first summer where my skimmers haven't constantly been full of gigantic water spiders. I attribute that to the massive frog. So, we have another frog friend. And then I don't, I don't know what I'm going to do with them. I'll just put them there. I'll just... Oh, did you guys hear my voice crack? That was lovely. I've decided for now I'm going to go ahead and just leave the pump in there, disturbing the surface, because I actually I don't want the frog getting back in there. A pot of this height, that frog doesn't stand a chance against the dogs. So I would prefer he go elsewhere. been raining for two days straight. Well, off and on for two days. There's some sun coming through. A little bit of blue up there. Oh, so nice to be outside again. Alright, looks like there might be more rain moving in. Well, it was nice while it lasted. These guys are making some noise. Go hungry? Yeah. I always give it a few knocks so that 
they can associate sound with being fed helps keep them from being quite as shy. And just finished responding to comments. I have not been great about staying on top of that. Sorry about that. I have some errands I need to run. I'm out of this really nice hand scrub I use made by Lush. It's uh it exfoliates and moisturizes and it just it it works miracles. My hands get really dry from working with the fish tanks and heavy lifting with rocks and but this stuff is amazing and I just ran out. So I was gonna order it online. It's like the only thing I buy from Lush, but the malls out here are kind of struggling, so I might just go to the mall, which is like one of my least favorite things to do. And uh, I need to get some snails. That's probably not something you thought I would say. I need to get some snails for the that aquaponics tub. It's almost time to move those in. I can leave the fish out here. I mean, I could leave them out all winter, probably, if I protect it properly, but I would prefer to go ahead and bring them in and around the same time bring the plants in because that's the water I use to water my plants. Uh, but uh, there's some algae building up and I don't really mind algae too terribly much. It uh, has plenty of benefits to it but there are some spotlights in there and I'm having to constantly scrub the lenses off on them so I figured I might go pick up like a dozen apple snails and uh, hope that the koi don't eat them. They have some nice big ones there, so at the place I'm going, the pond supply store, they have lots of pots, lots of big things. I'm gonna call them, and uh, I, maybe I'll take y'all along with me. We'll see. It's not really plant related, but it could be fun. I just got a phone with Lush, and they have both sizes, so I guess I'm gonna go to the mall, which means I have to get dressed and look nice like a real human. How about those new kicks, though? That's some intense color. And I love them. They match nothing, which makes them pretty much perfect because I can wear them with anything. What's with the white soles though? Can we stop with that? I know that that's like the most popular thing, but I, you can't wear them anywhere without getting them dirty. Just remembered this is a plant channel, so I digress, let's go. So I may or may not have taken the longest route possible to go where I'm going just because Starbucks. I need that caffeine though. Finally here, this place has some of the most beautiful pottery, but holy crap, it is so expensive. Look at these crate myrtles. Nice thick trunks. They look nice. There's nobody here in this place that's tiny, so I don't know if I'm gonna be having the camera out. That might be kind of awkward. We will see. Change of plans. They are closed, which is really odd for the middle of the day on a Wednesday. How are you in business if you're not open in the middle of the day on a Wednesday? It's noon. Why Why aren't you open? This isn't the islands. It's not Mexico. There's no siestas here. What's going on? Very frustrated. That was a big waste of my time. And who would think to check somebody's store hours at noon on, on a weekday? I don't know. Whatever. Off to the mall. Made it to the mall. Hopefully this goes quick and fast. Finally entering into the place where people go that actually like being around other people. Done. Took like two minutes. Got my hand scrub. Back to gardening stuff. Okay, so everybody's entitled to cookies now, huh? Sit down. Tucker, you better sit. Good boy. Toby. There you go. You know, and it's not that I don't like going to the mall or to Lush. You go in there and they start like massaging your hands with lotions and things and... It's, is it raining? I think it's raining a little bit. What? And I usually like when I'm shopping, I like to be in and out. And they're smart with the massaging and the whatnot because you know in our hands and in our feet uh and in some other very specific areas i'm about to we're gonna go from gardening to a little bit of neuropsych here we have 
specialized cells in the palms of our hands, the bottoms of our feet. Uh, they are in our lips and genital area. And these cells are wide. They have a lot of surface area, kind of like when you cut an onion in half. And when you apply pressure or sensation to these cells, it tells your brain to go ahead and open up the floodgates and let dopamine through. So you get the dopamine moving through your brain and it goes ahead and it relaxes you and it's nice and it's just, you know, an overall pleasurable experience. This is why sometimes nervous people, fidgety people, they fidget. You'll see them playing with their hands a lot or shuffling, maybe they'll shuffle their feet because it's self-soothing. It's like, hey, when I do this, I feel a little bit better. So that's smart of these people at Lush to be like, oh, let me go ahead and put lotions on you because it does stimulate your brain to release that dopamine, relaxes you, and makes everything feel nice. But for me, I just prefer I just go and grab my product and get out of there. You don't need to be touching me. I'm fine. But this is another reason why I discovered I like to exfoliate and moisturize my hands because when I can feel things, it feels nice. Like, it was nice to know, like, oh my goodness, I had no idea my cat was so soft. Or, wow, my dog needs a bath. When you have callus and dead skin, those sensory cells are blocked off. You're not feeling things. How this applies to gardening? Eh, 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 I don't really know, but that doesn't matter. It's my channel and I can do what I want. I just got a package in the mail. It's got some bugs in it. Let's talk beneficial predators. I'm going to go ahead and kind of work on getting a few things set up here and just emphasize a little bit more. That's what I was talking about with the neuroscience behind the hands and the feet and whatnot. And I remember how I was saying how, you know, if you see somebody who's fidgety and they're playing with their hands, they seem nervous or shuffling their feet, that lets us know people are nervous. Nonverbal communication. If you're observing something based on somebody's movement or gestures or facial expressions, that's nonverbal communication. It's not body language. Anytime you hear somebody say, Oh, I'm, I'm a body language expert, you see that on TV on the talk shows, they're full of crap. There's no such thing as body language. But I, I think it's more universally understood. People know what body language is. That's probably why they use that terminology. So, but yeah, and hey, if you're ever stressed out, Playing with your hands, apply pressure in here. Circular motions, that helps, helps a lot. Release that dopamine, help relax yourself a little bit. Focus on the way your hands feel. Fidget with something in your hand, like a, a ball maybe that has some spikes on it. Massage that around and focus on what it feels like. Describe what it feels like. Use third person terminology. Jeff thinks this feels bumpy. These are things that help relax you and de-stress you. And uh, that works very, very well, believe it or not. So next time you're feeling anxious or stressed out, give that a try. It's something you can do. It's quick and simple and relaxing and lowers your heartbeat and all kinds of fun things. Let's talk bugs. All right, so I have here two different products. I have been having an aphid explosion. And this seems to happen... Kind of every fall. I, you know, I spray with the neem throughout the year, but it just doesn't always seem to do the trick, unfortunately. And the problem I'm having most specifically is on my crepe myrtles and my hibiscus. My crepe myrtles, though, it's only the crepe myrtles that are near where those mosquito people sprayed. And I walked them around the whole garden and said, here's a crepe myrtle, here's a crepe myrtle. They said they know what crepe myrtles were. They wouldn't spray near them but I actually watched them spray near a few of them. Not on them. Last year they sprayed on them, despite me telling them not to, but it was close enough. And here's the problem with that. These sprays that they use also kill ants. And crepe myrtles have a symbiotic relationship with ants. The ants, to my understanding, I'm going to brush up on this, and if I totally butcher it, then I'll come back around and fix it. I, all I'm going with here is anecdotal observation. I notice when the mosquito spray gets sprayed near the crepe myrtles, the crepe myrtles, within a few days, look like absolute garbage and become overrun with aphids and white flies and all kinds of just nasty little bugs. So logically, like I said, this is all anecdotal observation. All I can deduce is that the ant's relationship with the crepe myrtle must somehow affect the immunity of the crepe myrtle, the immunity being the thickness and strength of the cell walls within the plant, something happens when the ants aren't around that seems to make the leaves more thin and allows 
predators to dive right in and just tear into the plants. This is my guess anyway. I'm going to read up on it. You guys let me know what you think. You do some reading too. So, here's my solution. I'm done with sprays for the year. It's almost time to move the plants inside. It'll be within the next few weeks. The weather here is very unpredictable. It could be two weeks from now. It could be six weeks from now. I just don't know. But I have here ladybugs, which are excellent for aphid control. I mean, it says on here, what does this thing say? Aphids, whitefly scales, mealybugs, spider mites, and also many soft-bodied insects. I don't know about these guys eating mealybugs. We'll see about that. And maybe, maybe they do, maybe they don't. I really do not know. But I feel like if ladybugs ate mealybugs, then we would be talking about it a lot more. Because mealybugs are such a problem for so many people. And then here, these are lacewings. Well, these actually are not lacewings. These are lacewing eggs and soldier beetle larva. Here's their little, their little piece of paper. It says they eat aphids, leafhoppers, spider mites, mealybugs, thrips. Maybe. I do know that soldier beetles are excellent pest exterminators. So, I, <laughs> I'm not quite sure if... The, these are going to cancel each other out, like, are these going to eat these, or are these going to eat these? We'll find out. I'm going to try them in some different areas. Uh, but with the lace wings, I've always received these on a piece of paper. These came in a bag with uh, this, like, hold rice in it. And then it came with this bag that has these little envelopes in it. Multiple envelopes, these guys right here. And what it's saying to do is to pour this into here and hang it. So kind of just like what you would do with those cards that they normally come on. Let's scoot these back but keep them out of the sun. So I guess that's what I'm going to do, but the thing is I do already see plenty of soldier beetles moving around in here. Can you see them? It might not be able to focus on them very well. But up there, there's a soldier beetle, there's a soldier beetle. Yeah, it's really probably not going to focus in on them very well. So they're just going to crawl right out of the pouches, which is fine. I just don't want them on me. I don't, I'm not really worried about being bit by them. The thrips, my thrips, and earwigs, man, they bite. Holy moly, they bite and it hurts. But maybe these will help with that. I'm not quite sure. So I was gonna go ahead and I was gonna go I was going to go ahead and release the ladybugs. Now you're supposed to release them at dusk or dawn, uh, or at any time of the day on a cloudy day, and it has been very cloudy here. But just like a minute ago, as I'm sure you can kind of see here, the sun popped out and the sky looks absolutely gorgeous and majestic. So uh, I'm gonna wait until things get cloudy again to let them go. But when I release them, what I'm going to do is I'm gonna spray everything down with water, get everything nice and wet. And then I'm going to scatter them around the base of the plants. And then they'll work their way up. And, you know, they'll move around. They'll go where they want to. They're ladybugs. You can't tell them what to do. But I'm going to put them in the areas where I need them the most. I'm going to put them near my crepe myrtles and my hibiscus, which is where I'm seeing the majority of the aphids. That seems to be where pretty much all of them are, actually. But I need to go through and walk around and do a close look at everything before I dump them all in one spot. Or one type of plant. Yeah. Talking is hard. And then with these guys, the lace wings, or the eggs and soldier beetle, lar beetle larva, larvae, I guess I'll be putting them in the pouches and hanging them from the trees where I'm noticing a problem. Uh, like I said, I'm a little bit torn on what to do exactly with these because I just don't want soldier beetles crawling all over my body on my person but uh, I'll figure it out again with everything this is very experimental I know that these things eat what I want them to it's just I've never received them in this form for the lace wings and the eggs and I already know that I have lace wings out here lace wing eggs if you look, you'll notice sometimes on your plants there might just look like there's a little teeny tiny string coming off of it. A little hair. And there's usually like a drop at the end of it. It's just a little filament. Those are lacewing eggs, usually. I mean, other insects have some more eggs. But usually there's multiples laid in a row. And that's what there are, what those are. So 
I already know I have them. I want some more because I have heard that soldier beetles are great with eating mealybugs. We will see. I've been battling mealybugs off and on for years. It's pretty much under control. I have one plant that I know of that still has a fair amount of mealybugs on it, and I have separated it from the rest of my plants at this point, and if I don't eradicate every single one of them, that plant is going to be no more. So I'm going to try this. And we'll see how that works. Either way, I'm keeping it separated for the next year from everything because I just, I'm so over the mealy bugs and the spraying. And it doesn't work when I move my plants inside to spray because that's when I go all organic and pesticide free because of the aquaponics pond. It looks like the lacewing package came with four of these envelopes. They're just like wax paper, parchment papery things. I'm going to go ahead and just pop a hole up here. That'll do. This stuff isn't heavy, it doesn't need to be very strong. And then I'm going to take my string. I don't need too much. I'm gonna make sure there's extra though, because sometimes tying clear string is a little bit tricky. Cut that off there. And then, you know, the obvious thing. Take my envelope, take my string, pull it through here and attempt to tie a knot while my arms are wrapped around a camera and I'm doing things in a very awkward unnatural motion. Okay so the reason I was using the clear string is because it's all I could find. I know I have twine somewhere it's just always disappearing but I was thinking about it and twine really would work but oh hello look at you oh that smells so nice twine really will work best I would prefer to use it, and here's why. I found string. Garage door still opening. Welcome to next week's project. So, I said here's why. The reason that I think string is going to be better... <sighs> Security camera's screaming at me. I know, I'm trespassing my own property. Um, here we go. That clear string one. Hard to tie on something that doesn't have weight to help secure the knot. These little pouches weigh nothing. I think the string will be easier for these beetles to crawl up as well. I would imagine they can crawl up that other stuff just fine. But I want them to be able to get up into the plants as easily as possible. So, switching over to actual string. You know, it doesn't need to be something that's going to hold up to the elements immaculately. Because it's, they're probably only going to be hanging up for a week or so. And then uh, everything should be out of there. So I think this is just better. Okay, so you ready to see the infestation I was talking about? Aphids, aphids everywhere. So much so that we already have the wild ladybugs going to town on them. But it's going to take a lot of ladybugs to get this under control. Not just are there aphids everywhere, but there are some signs here of whitefly. A little caterpillar up there. Yeah, you see all this? Potential whitefly damage. You can kind of see there's this mildewy, black-like, sooty mold that's produced from the waste of the white flies on these leaves. And you can kind of see their exoskeletons, that white powder. And just from like gently shaking this, it's like a cloud of tiny little white flies goes, goes all over the place. So, got my pouch hung. I'm gonna go ahead and pour a bunch of these soldier beetles in there. All right, so this is kind of nifty. Turns out the tip of that pouch has like a spout in it. I was able to just pull open. I don't think I'm gonna be able to do this. No, I'm not. I have to do it and come back. Alright, so I barely touched the plant and I'm covered. <laughs> covered in bugs. So, here's what I did. Pulled it open, dumped those in there, and we'll just, you know, let time do its thing. I have three left. I'm going to go ahead and do those now. Alright, done with that. You can see here's my pink velour crepe myrtle. It has all the same spots and the same symptoms as the other crepe myrtle. And, you know, the reason I'm assuming this has something to do with the spray is because the one crepe myrtle they didn't spray 
That one really looks quite spectacular compared to the others. The leaves are nice and green and stiff. I'm starting to see some symptoms of possible infestations, but that's going to happen when you have these extreme abundant amounts of aphids and white flies and things on your other plants. They're going to spread to everything else. So hopefully between the lace wings and the ladybugs, we'll start to get this under control. Going to give it three weeks to a month if that's how much time I have before I move them inside and uh, see what they look like on the note of the ladybugs. I think it's too sunny right now. So I am going to wait until this evening to do this or very, very early tomorrow morning. In the meantime, I'm going to keep them in the shade. It is pretty cool outside, so they should be okay for another day in here. I feel kind of bad for them being trapped in that cup, but uh, you can stick these in your refrigerator for up to two weeks. I don't think I'm going to do that, though, since I'm going to try and use them tonight. I'm just going to keep them in the shade, keep them nice and cool. It's nice and cloudy now. So... Gonna get to letting these ladybugs go. I'm gonna go ahead and spray things down. I'm not gonna spray the foliage too much because I don't wanna knock all those nasty bugs off and have them go all over my other plants. Even though there's a lot of stuff online that says use a pressure washer, spray the bugs off your plants. I don't like to do that because logically you might not kill all the plants. And if you don't kill, or you might not kill the bugs with the pressure washer that is. And if you don't kill the bugs and you spray them off, they're just going to go elsewhere and you're going to spread your infestation. I mean, you have to use a pretty high pressure to be sure that you're actually killing all of them, especially with the pressure washer. Often just the blast, the breeze from it moving by will knock the bugs off. So that's why I'm going to try and hit these gently from kind of far away, get them nice and wet. And then I'll go through and start releasing those ladybugs. The reason that it's important to go ahead and spray the plants down with water and that it be cloudy outside is you want your ladybugs to stick around. If it's not cloudy and it's sunny and it's dry, if they've been in these containers, they're dehydrated, more than likely dehydrated. So when you let them go, they're gonna be like, hey, there's no food here, there's no water, I'm hungry they're going to leave. So the main point is to encourage them to stick around and to give them a drink. I mean, these guys, I feel so bad for them in this little cup. Oh, his impatience got leggy this year. They're reaching for the sun. This is going to be hard to do with one hand without getting ladybugs all over my person. I mean, look at that. I just barely cracked the lid open and they're already coming out. Let's do this and work fast. If the lid will come off. There we go. There's a whole bunch of ladybugs down to the ground. Excuse you. Hello. All right. Okay, I'm going to be covered in ladybugs by the time we're done here. Just kind of sprinkling them around. Oh, it's <laughs> doing this so fast. Get in here. Get the bugs. Aphids all over me. I'm not a huge fan of what... Oh, sh That was too many. Okay need to make what's left count. So, you know, it would probably be smarter to order these where you get several small pouches as opposed to one big cup. But hey, is is what it is. Go ahead and get some out there. Let some go over here. Go on, guys. Be free. You usually want to let them go more down towards the dirt. They'll crawl up the plant on their own. Alright, and then over here gonna set the cup down like so so that water doesn't get in there and let the rest of them crawl out there we go and you can kind of already see them moving around getting their drinks white flies and gnats flying around out here so that's good they're sticking around they're thirsty should work out okay moving on I picked up these hanging baskets from my local nursery. These are the Cool Wave Pansies. Cool Wave Pansies are nice. They trail. You're not supposed to have to deadhead them, though I usually rarely deadhead my pansies. It's best to do it. It's just, it's usually pretty cold out when I'm growing them, so I don't bother. But my nurseries around here typically sell a four inch pot of the Cool Wave Pansies for anywhere from $4.99 to $5.99 for one. So there's one that I planted right there. The problem is, I use lots of pansies in the fall, winter, and spring. I plant them in the fall where I live. They usually keep growing pretty much all winter and spring. 
these big hanging baskets were $8.99 and each one has about four different plants in it so financially this makes much more sense. There's a problem though. The Cool Wave pansies are fairly new and uh, I asked the lady at the nursery a question. I said, do you know are these as hardy throughout the winter as regular pansies? And she said, well, just like the other pansies, they'll die as soon as there's frost outside. And I was like, well, that's an odd thing to say because that's simply not true. Pansies are traditionally planted in the fall to grow through winter and spring. They like cool temperatures. I plant pansies outside in my front yard every single fall and they grow a little bit, not much, but they flower pretty much all winter, except for when it's horribly, horribly, horribly cold. So I was thinking, hey, maybe she's from Minnesota or something. Maybe it's too cold where she's from to do that. But here in St. Louis, we're 6A on the border of 6B, or we're on the border of 6B and 7 and 6A. It's kind of complicated, the city heat and whatnot, but generally zone six, they do fine. Sometimes they have a bad winter and they die, but traditionally they're sold at all the nurseries around here in the fall for people to plant and have flowers throughout the winter. So I want to know, are the cool waves as tough? Are they going to do that? Because they trail, so if you have them hanging over a pot, I would imagine they would be less cold tolerant. So she went on, kept elaborating on how pansies, you know, they'll die when it frosts, which is not true at all. And I was like, oh, well, maybe you're thinking of violas or violas, whatever you want to call them. Which are those guys up there? They're the teeny tiny little baby pansies. They're not always as cold tolerant. Sometimes they're more cold, cold tolerant. There are different varieties and I don't know which are better. I've heard the jumping jack is supposed to be pretty tough, but I don't know if the jumping jack is a pansy or a viola. And so when I said that about the violas, she goes, oh, well, those are violas right here. And I was like, the, these, well, the tags say cool wave pansies on them. She goes, oh, they're violas. I was like, okay, clearly, I think you don't know what you're talking about. I didn't say this. I was just thinking it in my head. I was like, I don't think she knows what she's talking about. And so she's just kind of making things up because she doesn't want to be wrong. That's something that's kind of always baffled me. What's wrong with being wrong? We're human. We make mistakes. We fumble and mess stuff up all the time. Go ahead and say, I don't know. Or let me find out for you. That's a good question. That would be an appropriate response. So, on that note, on my channel, if I don't know something, I'm not going to pretend to know it. I will usually say, I don't know. Let me find out. That's a good question. Or I'll say, let me look into that. Or I'll just look into it, figure it out, and answer you with what I figure out. There's a point to all this. A huge pet peeve of mine is passing along false information. That doesn't help anybody. There's no reason to pretend you know something you don't know. And if I can't hardcore cite something, I'm not going to pass it along as fact. I'll say this is what I've heard, or this has been my experience, or it's anecdotal. But I'm not going to pass it along and be like, this is hardcore truth and fact. And I'll be the first one to say when I'm wrong. It's okay. This, we're all here to learn together. That's why I always say keep on growing. That's the whole point here. So I'm not thrilled that that happened. So... It happens a lot in life. That's okay, kind of, not really, it's actually pretty annoying. But let me tether back to several minutes ago, or however long ago in this video, when I said that ants have a symbiotic relationship with crepe myrtles. This is what I've always been told. But I went ahead and I thought, why don't I read up on this? It's an interesting subject, I'd like to talk about it. Well, I got online. I cannot find anything to substantiate that as fact. In fact, everything I'm finding is the opposite. Though anecdotally, I do notice when my crepe myrtles get sprayed, the ants disappear and the aphids and all the other bugs go crazy. So what I'm trying to figure out is why is that happening? But nothing I'm finding online is suggesting that that has anything to do with a symbiotic relationship between ants and the crepe myrtles. Not to say it's not out there, but I'm not finding it just yet. So let's erase that. Crepe myrtles, I'm going to go ahead and say, probably do not have a symbiotic relationship with ants. Everything I'm finding is the exact opposite. The antithesis of that. But, you know, things get pretty deep and maybe I'm just looking in the wrong places. At the surface, what I'm finding, aphids, as this is probably going to be something everybody knows, but aphids, soft-bodied insects that chew on our plants, that's why there's yellowing here. It's from them chewing on the plants. 
Well, then honeydew is secreted. Honeydew basically being a waste byproduct of that chewing, of the digestion, of a sap that the plants release, whatever the case is, it's sweet. Ants feed off of it. It's sugar, it's carbohydrates, they love it. And there's a lot of stuff out there saying that, okay, so the ants end up really utilizing that honeydew. Therefore, sometimes end up even protecting the aphid population. So what I'm finding are things saying, get rid of the ants to control the aphids because they're protecting them. Maybe this is true. It makes sense. Ants are territorial. They're smart. They'll do something like that. That, that makes perfect sense to me. But what still does not make any sense at all is why when the ants are killed, the health of the crepe myrtles declines so incredibly rapidly. Now, maybe it's not the ants dying. Maybe it's the chemical that's used. Maybe the chemical that's being used by these mosquito companies, maybe it does something to clog up the stromatophores in the plants. It's the little cells that open up and allow the respiration with some release oxygen. Maybe that's what's happening there. And maybe when those get clogged up, it weakens the leaves, and typically your aphids will feed on your new growth, soft new growth. Maybe it makes all of the growth susceptible. Maybe that's what's happening. I don't know. What I do know is I have an infestation. Spraying has not been working very well, so I'm going natural. I was using natural sprays to begin with. I'm going to give it a few weeks and see what happens. I find it hard to believe that with an infestation of this magnitude that natural solutions such as using the ladybugs and lace wings are going to eradicate the problem. I think that's kind of wishful thinking, but it's worth trying because I think it's just environmentally responsible to give that a shot first. But I can't have the spreading to my other plants, especially not right now. It's too close to when it's time to move them into the growth space. Now, YouTube has a discussion tab. I haven't activated mine yet, but maybe I'll do that and we can all talk together about this. And like I said, I haven't dug horribly deep. I've more been in the process of making this video and reading up on just the care and life cycles of the lace wings and the ladybugs. But on the surface, it's looking like all this stuff that's being spat out saying that, oh, well, ants, they're important to crepe myrtles. So if you kill the ants, crepe myrtle dies. I can't find anything to prove that. Everything I'm finding is the exact opposite. It says get rid of the ants. So I don't know. You guys, maybe you know something. I don't. Let's figure this one out together. So I will try and get that discussion tab to open up, put a subject in there. I'm not totally sure how it works, but... Uh, Give it a shot. Figure it out together. Oh, ladybugs are already working their way up the plant. Go get some food. You got some eating to do. Oh, that's a big jump. You're a tough guy. You keep... No, no, no. Turn around. Turn around. They're down here. Come on. They're down here. You're going the wrong way. And you know, I could have very easily just edited out the part where I said the stuff about the ants and the symbiosis with the crepe myrtles and all of that, that doesn't seem productive to me. I think that sometimes there's way too much pride when it comes to gardening, especially the orchids. We need to drop our pride because this is how we grow together, it's how we figure things out, it's how we learn. And you know, let's not perpetuate false information. There's so much false information out there when it comes to gardening and horticulture, especially with the orchids. Okay, looks like some rain might be moving in. I'm gonna wrap things up. I hope everybody's doing well. I'm gonna get that discussion tab opened up. Don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, all that fun stuff down below. I love talking to y'all. You can follow me on Snapchat, Trop Plant Party. I'm trying to get better at posting on there. And uh, I hope everybody's doing well. Like I keep saying, keep on growing. <laughs>